Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined again by Dr. Fuzz Rana, and we're going to be looking at spider silk and how it points to a creator. Fuzz, good to have you back in the studio. Jeff? So, spider silk, kind of what are, why are we even talking about spider silk? Yeah, well, you know, I, I imagine most people haven't ever thought about spider silk, and if you had, well, I guarantee they have when they walked out and they get the fuzz all over their faces. Yeah, yeah, they or those cobwebs that are impossible to get <laughs> off of the ceiling. But, but the fact of the matter is, the the silk that makes up uh, spider webs is an incredibly fascinating, remarkable material. Uh, just kind of some fun facts: it it is an organic material. Yet, and it's one sixth the density of, of steel, okay. but it, estimates are it's three to four times stronger than steel. It has a remarkably high tensile strength and it's, it's got high ductility. And so it's a ductility re, being a kind of flexible strength that's <laughs> it's why you can't get the stuff off of yeah, it because it's just keeps bending around you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and so it's a, this incredibly remarkable fiber mm -hmm. that uh, material scientists realize that if we could figure out how to make something like spider silk, we could revolutionize a number of industries that require fibers, mm -hmm. you know, that would be that strong. It, it seems like that would be a relatively straightforward thing. I mean, you can analyze the chemicals that are in there, presumably get yeah. the chemical structure and just replicate it. So have we been able to do that? Yeah, well, I mean, biochemists understand the, the chemical composition and the structure of, of silk fibers. And so mm -hmm. if you think of a very thin fiber, that fiber is made up of a large number of protein molecules, which are strand-like molecules that kind of interact to make the fiber. And, and these, uh, f these uh, uh, molecules have interesting properties. Mm -hmm. uh, parts of the chain are, are what are called amorphous. They don't have any real structure. They're flexible, but other parts are formed from what's called a beta sheet, which is kind of a zigzag structure. Okay. And those zigzags can stack on top of each other from different protein chains to form these crystalline regions. So you've got a so presumably you got some chains here. You know, so a chain will here. It'll they're, they'll kind of like build bridges between the chains. Yes, so you, exactly. Okay. All right. So you've got these crystalline regions, these amorphous regions. The crystalline regions give it the tensile strength, mm -hmm. and the amorphous regions give it the the, the ductile strength. Okay. And so we understand that, mm -hmm. uh, and and we understand how spiders spin the the, the silk. The, the silk is held in these glands called silk glands, right? And they they exist in there kind of in a gel state, where there's water in these these pre fibers. Mm -hmm. They extrude it through a spinneret, which sheds the water, and that out comes a solid fiber. Okay. So people have naively gone in the lab and they've taken spider silk that's kind of a, like a gel and they've tried to extrude it and you can't produce the fibers that would be like the fibers that are produced when the spider spins the silk. So, so presumably you're going to get something that either isn't as strong, isn't as ductile, right. breaks, whatever. Right. So it, this is so recently a team of researchers realized that there was actually an ultra structure to the gel itself where you had kind of like these structural domains that were hierarchical it, within the gel. And so, so it's not like there's inside the chamber where the gel is, there's compartments. It's the gel is kind of organized in and of itself. Right. And so they, and so by understanding that, they think that this may actually be contributing to what's happening during the extrusion process hmm. to transition from a gel into this incredibly durable fiber. So it's not just simply the chemical composition that's important, but it's the process by which the transition from the gel to the solid fiber takes place and what the structure is before that transition happens that seems to be important. So people are now hoping that they can go out and take that insight and maybe come up with a manufacturing process that could produce silk that would be, again, something that could then be translated into a manufacturing operation. You know, th this strikes me as uh, things that I've run into a number of times in my scientific research and in building things. I look and say, oh, that's, I, I kind of understand that mechanism. I got to be able to go reproduce that. And then I work pretty hard at it and I can't do it. Uh, or, or it takes me a lot of resources and ingenuity to figure out how to do it. 
uh, spiders aren't sitting around thinking, how can I be ingenious and make silk? But it does seem, uh, is this where the case for the creator comes in, that it looks like it's very well designed? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you see this elegant, ingenious, sophisticated design that mm -hmm. suggests the creator's handiwork. But there's something else that's also interesting, and that is that you have scientists and engineers that are turning to the designs in nature to inspire the next generation of, of, of fibers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is not just the only example. There's a whole industry called biomimetics and bioinspiration where engineers and scientists systematically turn to designs in nature to inspire new technology, or sometimes they just copy what's in nature directly to create new technologies or to solve problems. You know, that that's a fascinating development, but, you know, because, I mean, you know, I think it's relatively indisputable that humans are pretty, mm -hmm. got a lot of ingenuity, creative, can do a lot of things. We've been able to do things that are very clearly not naturally produced, and yet here we are looking at nature mm -hmm. to build stuff that seems to just exist by chance, quote unquote. Right to inspire us to build things better than what we've been able to come with on our own. Right, and so to me, what biomimetics and bioinspiration imply is that the designs in biology really are elegant and sophisticated. And if a creator was responsible mm -hmm. for the world that we live in, then you would expect that those designs would be this, the types of designs that we would want to copy for our technology. Yeah, and well, it, there, it's almost like they, we need to have some level of technology to even appreciate that there are designs that we can replicate, if you will. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, I remember seeing, uh, you know, we look at fireflies. I love fireflies. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got this incredibly efficient chemical reaction, but even the structure of the scales allows the light to get out more efficiently because you got mm -hmm. indices of refraction there. And we've taken that physical mechanism and increase the light output of our LEDs. That mm -hmm. Until we made LEDs, we didn't even know that this was something we could replicate, if you right. will. You know, I, I, it just, it's, it's interesting, the, the interplay there. Yeah, well, it seems like arthropods and, and, and insects are prime candidates for inspiring technologies. You know, but there's something else about this that also is interesting, and that I think it represents a challenge to the evolutionary paradigm. Because when you look at the nature of how uh, of the evolutionary mechanism that people conceive, it's one where evolution presumably takes pre-existing designs, mm -hmm. modifies them, cobbles them together with other pre-existing designs to create something new. And right. th th what's produced is kind of a kludge job. It's kind of jimmy-rigged together through evolutionary processes. Just enough to accomplish what needs. Exactly. And so if that's really the nature of biological designs, then why would anybody in their right mind turn to those kind of designs to inspire engineering? So to me, biomimetics and bioinspiration fits better in a creation model framework than in, in, an, in, a, in an evolutionary framework. And in, in fact, you could even see it as really being an intelligent design research program. Thanks, Fuzz. I appreciate your comments. You know, we may get annoyed by walking through spider webs, but this is just one example of how when we look at something in creation, we actually get inspiration to build better technology than what we could come up with on our own. That makes perfect sense if there's a creator behind it all who's fashioned this creation to help us enjoy, worship, and follow and see him. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Fuzz's blog on this topic. Just search for spider silk. You'll find his blog and be equipped to use this fascinating discovery to point to the Creator and share Jesus with those around.